when you dive in 10 meters or 100 meters or 270 meters of water, uh, the same principles apply. You're in an alien environment and you're using life support equipment, whether it's open circuit or closed circuit, doesn't matter. Safety on every dive, no matter how shallow, should be your primary concern. Today we're going to explore safety first, and lessons from the last dive. The Last Dive is my first book. It's now out in, I think it's 10 languages. It was first published in the year 2000 in both the United States and in Germany. It came out simultaneously and is now in a number of, as I said, other languages. The lessons you'll learn during this talk are applicable across the board in all our diving activities and even in our day-to-day -day activities, such as commuting and in any activity that carries with it inherent danger, such as diving. I'll first show slides, and then I'll show a video, um, and that video is taken on a German World War II U-boat off the coast of the United States. I'd ask that you hold your questions until the end. <clears throat> Not every lesson can be learned from a book. Uh, I'd like to know how many of you have read The Last Dive or are familiar with it? Quite a number of you. <laughs> But you can always even uh, get new information, pick up new information from when you read the book. Uh, for example, even if you're going to a new place as a tourist and you pick up books, you find out all kinds of things, but there's always stuff they don't tell you in books. And something happened to me when I was in Australia. I, uh, I learned something very interesting about their neighbors, the New Zealanders. Um, so you can see here. I'm sure you won't see this in any uh, book or guide, so it's just like that too with the last dive and, and some of the stuff that we'll talk about. Uh, this image, by the way, is actually courtesy of a, a Kiwi, as we call New Zealanders, right? Uh, Dr. Simon Mitchell, who is uh, now a naturalized Australian. So um, I didn't know that. They, these guys, the Australians and the Kiwis, love bashing each other in, in good nature and fun. But this photo is of Chris and Chrissy Rouse that are really the narrative linchpin of my book, The Last Dive. They were also good friends of mine, and they were a father and son diving team. I love this photo here. We see the father, Chris, and the son, Chrissy. The, the photo really does capture them in what they were like diving, because the father was always very serious and, and, and approached the diving like, okay, we're gonna go diving now, let's get serious. And the son was always like, yeah, we're gonna go diving, let's have fun. And, uh, they were very, very interesting as a dive buddy team. And in fact, they were so interesting in the way that they communicated with one another that they were known as the Bicker Brothers on uh, dive boats throughout the Northeast United States. Some people thought that their routine of always bickering one, with one another was like a practiced sitcom, situation comedy that you'd see on television. And others thought that there might be more to it, that there might be uh, some type of competitiveness that would get them into trouble underwater. And this really becomes at the heart of, of what the book is about, and it gives us a porthole, as it were, into the world of both wreck and cave diving and the rise of what we today call technical diving. So let's set the scene here. A German World War II U-boat was discovered off the coast of New York and New Jersey, only a half day's mission from New York City. Yet it wasn't in any archive, it wasn't in the German, the British, or the American archives. So what was this thing doing there? It was discovered on Labor Day in 1991. Captains John Chatterton and the late Captain Bill Nagel are credited with its discovery. Video that Captain John Chatterton shot of this particular mystery wreck, or the U Who as everybody called it, was shown on television in the United States. It made newspaper accounts and headlines. And quickly there was a rush to find out what was this U-boat doing. There were all sorts of rumors that sprang up. Perhaps this was carrying high-ranking Nazi party members fleeing the fall of the Third Reich. Well, maybe. Maybe it was carrying spies. Well, that wasn't actually too outlandish because on two separate occasions, the Germans did land spies on the United States soil in the Second World War, once in Florida and once on New York's Long Island. And in both cases, the FBI rounded up those spies. But as John Chatterton said, once this became known that there was a U-boat, he said every nut 
and every theory, every crazy theory came out of the woodwork. But one thing was sure, the diver who would solve this mystery and clearly identify which U-boat this was and what mission it was on would really bag a, a prize, a treasure. And I like them. I like in wreck divers in particular, particular Northeast, U.S. Northeast wreck divers, to big game hunters who are trying to bag the big trophy. The more difficult and challenging it is, the more prestige one gets when one solves that. So Chris and Chrissy hope to be the ones to solve that mystery. But this isn't just the story of a father and son team who dove. It's also the story of a family who dove together and dove in caves, which is, I think, even today quite unusual, but it certainly was unusual back in the uh, early 90s. Here we see Chris Rouse. Oh, oh, let's go back. Here we see Chris Rouse with the, um, his wife, Sue, and, of course, Chrissy, the son. Now, Chris and Chrissy were very close in age. They were actually only 17 years in age apart, and they were more like brothers, really, than a father and son team. Anything that can be misunderstood has been misunderstood, including diving and our motivations. The last dive examines these things, including why people would want to challenge themselves by diving into difficult shipwrecks or jumping into water-filled holes in the ground for fun. As we've seen today, some excellent presentations by Don Shirley and Michelle Balkran, we really are pushing the limits more and more. And it's pretty amazing. But why are we doing that? There's a challenge for some people. Uh, some people want to set themselves up and challenge themselves, and also the, the technologies. I think people want to see how can we overcome our inherent limitations. So we have challenges, both physio uh, physiological and psychological. Um, but yeah, the common image of diving locale is such as this one here on a Mexican reef, very shallow, warm water, and in a reef environment, just like you have out here off the coast of Stockholm. <laughs> Now, of course, millions of dives are done every year in this kind of a, an environment. But even in these kind of very, very easy, benign environments, people still manage to die. Now, why is it that people die? Obviously, people die in, in caves such as the one that Don Shirley told us about, the tragic death of, the depth of 270 meters, where you could say, yeah, that's, that's a really challenging dive. But what about something like this here? Uh, one of the analyses I did was a wreck diving analysis years ago with the National Underwater Accident Data Center at the University of Rhode Island in the United States. And what I found was that it didn't matter the experience level. It didn't matter the dive site. People die in diving across all levels of experience and all types of environments. So it's not just the more challenging environments. In fact, Michelle, you better be careful here, because I know you're diving into a lot of these challenging environments, but even when you go to the Red Sea, a very, very easy environment, you can't let your guard down. You can't get complacent, because complacency kills. So what goes wrong in, in all of these? Obviously, one of the things that we enjoy about diving is that we can hang out with new buddies and experience the feeling of weightlessness. That's why a lot of people experience uh, diving. But we have to remain constantly uh, vigilant and respectful of the dangers underwater. There are some environments, of course, that immediately cause us to have more respect. This is a shot that's actually taken on Mount Everest by a friend of mine, Dr. Ken Kamler, from the Explorers Club. Now, clearly, an environment like this, or a deep cave, or a, a deep shipwreck, will cause us to want to take every <coughs> precaution that we can. We want to sit down and say, what can go wrong? How can we overcome that? How can we prevent things from going wrong? But it seems if we go away, if we, the more we're in these kind of environments, we could say, well, gee, you know, if we go to, say, the Red Sea, and we have just a single tank, oh, it's an easy dive, it's a 20-meter dive. Maybe I'm not feeling so good today. Eh, that's OK, it's only a 20-meter dive, right? Complacency kills. One of the things that we notice, not only in scuba diving, but in any sport that has inherent danger in it, say hang gliding or something like that, we notice that the, the typical dangers are for the very beginning participant of that sport, the, the neophyte, because they don't have enough experience to really know all the dangers. And then the more experienced a person gets at that particular sport, the more they get complacent and the more they're likely to make mistakes, particularly in 
uh, let's say in this case in dives, in which they think that it's a very easy dive. So what has traditionally motivated divers? Is it the challenge? Is it the novelty? It's something far more mundane. Part of what I like to look at is the history of how we even got to where we are today. Because you see, what has traditionally motivated divers is money. And in fact, you see a great example of that right next door at the, the Vassan Museum. Uh, here's a traditional uh, thing that was used to get divers underwater, a bell. And traditionally, divers went in the water to earn money. They retrieved, say, cannons uh, from shipwrecks like the Vasa that went down in fairly shallow water and fairly close to shore. <clears throat> this here, of course, is a more elaborate system. It's a, um, the German Klinger device. And here, this guy has an axe that might be to ward off uh, uh, sea creatures in the depths. But it's probably just to hack his way into wooden shipwrecks. Personally, my favorite is this here, the Lethbridge suit by an Englishman. This was made in the early 1700s. One of the things, let me point out how this works to you, because you'll probably notice that there is no uh, immediate air to the surface. Well, there is none, because that's the way it worked. These are little plugs here, and what would happen is, this is the head end, the guy would go in, he would have these, um, let me put his arms through these little slots, this was all watertight. This was a wood with resin on it. And then once he's in, then they close this hatch here, and he has to make do with the air that's inside of this container. They put him down, and he better not let go of this rope, because that's the only way he has to communicate with the surface. When he wants to come up, he has to pull a few times, and they bring him up. But then they have to get him back onto, typically it's a ship, it could also be the pier, and then they unscrew these things, and they take a bellows, and they start pumping air in there so that he has fresh air and won't die. Now, what this excellent illustration by Linda Heslop cannot show is the vast amount of space that must have been inside of this contraption just to fit this guy's big bass brass balls inside to get into this thing. But of course, the traditional diving suit, or the hard hat, has been used for a long, long time. But there's a challenge in this. We're all familiar with this type of stuff, but we very quickly forget, as we're talking today about dives that are being done to tremendous depths by amateur divers, sport divers, right? 270 meters we're talking, routine stuff. As uh, Michel was saying, 100 meters, that's almost become, for, for advanced technical divers, a routine type of thing. But it wasn't always that way, because early in the 1900s, it was only until the second decade of the 1900s, that the most advanced dive team on the planet at that time, British Royal Navy, took a guy to 200 feet, which is what, 60 meters, 59, 60 meters. And they, most importantly, were able to safely get that diver back, but they reached the technological limit at that time. Now, what was the technological limit? They actually had to use hand pumps, hand cranked pumps, with six men on each of two separate pumps just to supply the guy with air at 59 meters. But they actually got him there and back. But very shortly thereafter, relatively speaking, we can now throw on a pair of, of tanks, right? We want to take two as tech divers, at least two, and go down 59, 60 meters. That seems like, oh, very routine for us today. But it wasn't always that way. And in the book, I, I bring this up because we do get sometimes very complacent and think, oh, it's only a 59 or 60 meter dive that we're doing. But still, in, in these kind of environments, we can still get killed. But as I had said, there's always people trying to push themselves. The Rouses wanted to push themselves. And one of the people that they really admired, both of them really admired, Sheck Axley, as we see here, a great American cave diver. You've probably heard of him. He's now a uh, guy trying to set at that time, the world record for the deepest cave dive, although he held the world record. And he was pretty much in uh, friendly competition with uh, Jochen Hassenmeyer, a, a German, and they would always try to do these dives, and one would get the world record, and then the other one. But Scheck liked to push himself. And in the, uh, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, Scheck actually held just about every conceivable record that you could actually think of in cave diving. 
And at that particular time, the Rouses had taken a mixed gas cave course with Sheck. And there was no mixed gas courses officially. You couldn't get a card. Like today, you go and you can take any one of a number of courses from all sorts of different agencies and get a mixed gas course. It wasn't that way back then. You had to know somebody. You had to go, and it was very controversial. Even when Sheck started teaching people mixed gases, even though he was such a respected member of the cave diving community worldwide, and certainly in Florida where he lived, People gave him a lot of grief about teaching people technical diving, mixed gas diving, because people who were against this said, people are going to get killed doing this. And Sheck said, people are going to get killed doing this if they don't have the knowledge. We've got to give people who want to do this, who want to use this as a tool, the knowledge. So Chris and Chrissy and even Sue Rouse took the mixed gas course with Sheck in, uh, in late 1990. And Chrissy really admired Sheck and admired where he lived. The guy literally lived in a double-wide trailer that was right next to a hole in the ground where he would go yeah. cave diving. He said, wow, that's cool. And uh, Chrissy had said to me in a phone conversation that he thought he would be a much better diver and much uh, more famous diver than Sheck because Sheck was a great cave diver. And Chrissy was that too. Chrissy wanted to be a great cave diver and doing all sorts of exploration cave dives. But Sheck got seasick very easily, so he didn't wreck dive. And Chrissy was getting into wreck diving, thought he would also be a great wreck diver. So at 21 years old, Chrissy had told me, I'm going to be a better and more well-known diver than Sheck Exley, which is just a, a huge, huge statement. So Chrissy's motivation, in a lot of ways, for diving this mystery German U-boat, which was in uh, 230 feet of water, it was about 70-some meters of water, was to try to solve this mystery of this German U-boat and get himself a, a big name and big reputation. There are signs like this and people think, oh, it's not going to happen to me. People who have accidents, how many of us have had even car accidents or something? We don't get up and say, oh, today I'm going to have a car crash, right? But yet it can happen. The same thing happens when we're diving. We don't think that an accident can happen to us. Well, people look at signs like this that are prominently posted outside of Florida caves, and they just think, oh, it's not going to happen to me. Rules for diving, oh, I've got to be specially trained in cave diving. I have to have special equipment. Oh, no, that's for somebody else. But a lot of uh, divers, open water divers, including open water instructors, have died in caves just because they ignore signs like this. So what had happened was in the 1970s, or late 1960s and early 70s, so many people were dying inside of caves in Florida that the state of Florida and individual landowners wanted to shut down the cave diving, basically, as a sport. They were literally blowing up the entrances to caves. And so you, you would think that we learned about cave diving by experimenting, by trying what worked, and trial and error, and, and we we learned that way. Well, we didn't learn that way. We learned because people died inside of caves. So when people do die inside of, uh, of a cave or inside of wrecks or diving, I think we can all, as a community, learn from it and say, OK, what can we take away from this to make our own diving safer? So our friends' deaths or people that we know needn't be in vain if we take that approach. Here's a sign that's available today. Stop, prevent your death, go no further. And there are all sorts of facts. And then it says, there's nothing in this cave worth dying for. Do not go beyond this point. This, by the way, makes a great sign for your office door. <laughs> People are still ignoring signs like this. Where are these signs put? These signs are even put, typically, if you go into uh, the Florida cave systems that are very accessible, they're what we call even recreational cave systems, they're planted at the, the point, typically, where light is last visible. So if you're an untrained cave diver, you see this thing with the Grim Reaper and all sorts of scuba divers to speak, you can still turn around and find your way back out very safely. <coughs> Tragically, people don't seem to learn from this. It's not going to happen to me. Chuck Exley <coughs> feared that his sport, a very new sport of cave diving, was going to stop. So he actually examined the accidents that were happening and said, is there a common trend? Can we see and learn from all of these accidents that are happening? And from that came this book, Basic Cave Diving, A Blueprint for Survival. It's still in print, 
And this actually uh, became the basis for really all, for first cave diving, but really all technical diving stems out of this. And we can still learn from this book. If you haven't read this, you should. It doesn't matter what kind of diving you're doing. The lessons that you can learn from this are applicable to any type of diving. And Sheck did find <coughs> common trends among why cave divers were dying inside of caves. From that, we had training programs that came up that actually made the sport safer for, di for diving. <coughs> Some of the cave systems, of course, here's a, a shot. This is courtesy of West Skiles in Mexico. Um, I'm just going to flip through this. Um, obviously, attract a lot of, of different people. One of the things that really ended up exciting Chris and Christy Rouse when they were into their diving was a project that had happened a year before they started diving. They started diving in 1988, and their accident, their last dive, was in 1992. You might say, gee, they were only diving for four years, and they chose to do a very challenging dive. But they had, at that point, 800 log dives under their belt, and many under very, very challenging conditions. <coughs> One of the things that really excited them was the Wakala Springs project that happened in 1987, Dr. Bill Stone's project. They used scooters and they used mixed gases to be able to explore cave systems, they'll call a system at approximately 120 meters at that time. Military and commercial divers thought that this project would involve a whole lot of people getting bent or a lot of deaths, but nobody even got bent on this project. And it lasted for months and months, and they were able to push in and map this particular system. And when the Rouses got into diving and found out about this, they said, wow, this is amazing. There's a new tool here, mixed gas diving that will enable us to go deeper and enable us to be able to push the underwater realm even further. So they got excited about that and then ultimately ended up taking the mixed gas course with Chef. But of course, everybody wants to push themselves, including the Rouses. And one of the things that they got attracted to was what was had been known for a long time as the Mount Everest of scuba diving, which was the wreck the Andrea Doria. It sunk off the U.S. East Coast in 1956 in a collision with the Stockholm. And this made news around the world because the wreck actually came to rest in about 80 meters of water. And it's very cold water, it's dark, it's challenging, there are sharks around. Ooh, the perfect place to go diving. So if you were anybody in diving, you wanted to test your limits. Now, of course, it made headlines here, uh, this shot of the Doria listing and sinking was taken from the Ile de France, and you see a lifeboat in the front. The Doria became a challenge. And as I said, if you go to a, a wreck to get artifacts, it's like a big game hunter uh, bagging a difficult trophy. The Rouses, of course, wanted to be like many Northeast divers and bag their trophies. It's still allowed, by the way, on the US uh, coast, the East Coast, to get artifacts from the shipwrecks. So in 1956, the Doria represented the very edge of what scuba divers could go to and reasonably, uh, safely be expected to come back from. Getting to a wreck or getting into a cave is not the most difficult thing. The most difficult thing is getting yourself back safely. Remember, the most important artifact you'll ever bring back is yourself. So of course, these uh, dishes were in the first class area of the Andrea Doria. They became prize trophies for divers. And if you were in the Northeast, you would hear the legendary divers talking about how difficult the Doria was to dive. And I think for anybody who is diving in the US Northeast, you'd say to yourself, well, I wonder if I'm good enough to do that. I wonder if I could have the skills. I wonder if I, I'll be physically and mentally tough enough to be able to do those dives. And of course, the Rouses thought that too. Here we see a diver, uh, this photo courtesy of Captain Steve Belinda, showing off one of his trophies. This is, um, uh, I think it's uh, John Holbert. And of course, the first class dishes were really prized. They're absolutely beautiful. My first dives in the Doria in 1990, um, I was uh, privileged to be with Gary Gentile, who's here in the middle. Um, this is his buddy Gary Gilligan. They were both crew members on the Wahoo, and uh, they were looking for an area in the third class 
um, section of the Doria China closet. They finally found it on their fourth and final dive and recovered all these dishes. And this was really exciting to be able to see these guys at work. This, by the way, is a much younger looking Hal Watts, who used to hold the record for deep air diving. Um, and he still is active and, and owns 40 Fathom Grotto in Florida, where he does, they still do training in deep air diving. And I'm not recommending deep air diving, I just bring that up as an historical aside. And of course, on those dives, I dove with Steve Berman, uh, shown here on, on the left. And uh, Steve and I were able to recover some dishes, and as rookies, that was a, a real big deal back then. Steve was a cave diving instructor in Florida, and, and I was also cave trained, and we just treated the Doria like a giant steel cave. Everybody else looked at us like we were nuts, all the wreck divers just said, what do you mean, you're just relying on this little guideline to find your way in and out of this shipwreck. But it worked for us because we had that training, and we, we said, this is how we're going to do the dives together. Chris and Christy got very excited to hear about this. Steve and I were diving on air, that's really all we had available to us at that particular time. And uh, we decided to come back with a team the next year and dive it on mixed gases. And Captain Steve Belinda, the Wahoo, was very open to that. So Steve suggested that we invite the Rouses, and they got very excited by all the attention. And, and the project just kind of mounted and took on a, a role of its own. And of course, um, when we talk about any of this stuff, we talk about Martini's laws, you know, for every 15 or so meters you go down, it's like having a martini on an empty stomach. Well, that can be kind of fun when you're at a party, but when you're down uh, uh, 75 and, and 80 meters, that can get very dangerous. So on the, the Team Doria 91 trip that we had, half the people were using mixed gases, and all sorts of different tables were out there. Um, that people were actually developing themselves. It was still the time before we had diving computers and before the time of the decompression programs. So it was very interesting because half of us were also using air. And so it, um, researchers were on board to measure, uh, for Doppler testing, to measure the potential um, of, of getting bent and all that sort of thing. And of course, no story about the Doria would be complete without talking about some of the rivalries. This is the Wahoo. Okay, this is the Wahoo, and uh, there was a ri real rivalry at that particular time. There weren't many boats going out to the Andrea Doria. Today, it's really become a magnet for, for divers all over the world. I know there are teams of Swedish divers who have been out there um, and from all over the place. But back then, we didn't have that many boats even going. And in order to even go out to the Doria, you had to know people they had to know you and be comfortable with your diving, and it was almost like you had to get invited to come and dive this particular shipwreck. The Wahoo was one of two major boats, the Wahoo and Seeker, that would be going out there. And divers who would dive on one or the other boat were known as either a Wahoo diver or a Seeker diver. And they actually had rivalries. The captains hated each other. Bill Nagel owned the Seeker, and Steve Belinda owned the Wahoo. And they liked to fling all kinds of mud at each other and all the rest. Well, one time, these guys, uh, go out on the Wahoo, and they discover a great area inside the Doria. All kinds of artifacts are coming out because they've discovered a china closet. And so, uh, sure enough, they, they decide, okay, um, we're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to um, get all these artifacts. You can't leave artifacts on the wreck, right? But we, when we go back, people will know about it. So what happens? Um, <coughs> they go down, actually it was on the secret that they discovered this. John, Captain John Chatterton goes down, he was a commercial diver at the time, and he actually welds a bar across the opening, the nearest opening, where you would go in to get the, the artifacts. He does this to prevent the Wahoo guys from getting the rest of the artifacts. Because Chatterton knows one thing, Wreck divers can't keep their mouths shut. Right? So when they're going to get back, they're going to tell everybody about all these artifacts. But sure enough, this is what happens when the seeker gets back. The, the, uh, everybody starts talking, hey, we got all these great artifacts. You missed a great trip, all this kind of thing. The Wahoo guys hear about it, and then they start figuring out where the artifacts have come from. So when they get out there, Chatterton has not only put a bar across there, but he's put a big sign that says, closed for inventory. <laughs> <laughs> so the guys from the Wahoo don't know about this, because Chatterton was smart, and he didn't tell 
all the rest of the other guys who are paying customers on the super guys. So the Wahoo guys go down and they see this stuff. They see this big sign. And they go, oh, geez, what are we going to do now? So they come back up, do the deep impression. And uh, Hank Garvin and, and his buddy are talking about this, going, how are we going to do this? And his buddy comes up with what is either a great dive plan or just an ingenious way to commit suicide. But they decide they're going to go for it. So the, the, the one buddy, Pete, goes down, and he's got on a single tank with his BC on. He takes off the tank with Hank's help. He pushes it underneath this steel bar that Chatterton has, has welded in the leg. He then crawls under, puts his tank back on, goes down to the, to the china closet, he finds it, and he gets, well, this china, ooh. So he comes back up, and he takes his bag, and he stuffs it back under the, under the steel bar, and Hank grabs that, and then he takes his tank off, he stuffs that back through, he crawls through, Hank helps him on with the gear, and they go back up to the surface triumphant, look, we've got all these great artifacts. And so they do this in teams and start cleaning out the rest of the dish closet, right? So Hank has taken, of course, they have to remove the sign that John Chatterton had put there. So what does Hank do? He puts a sign of his own back when they're all done in the box of lead. And that sign says, inventory complete. <laughs> it's a great story, and it gets a lot of chuckles from people. But one of the things about all of these guys, I mean, yes, their, their plan was pretty crazy. But one of the things about all of the guys in question, they had a lot of experience diving on the Doria. They knew the Doria intimately, not just from the deck plans, which are fairly easily available, but from what the Doria actually looked like. And they went back year after year and did many dives on them. But one of the things in diving and trying to solve the mystery of this German World War II U-boat that Chris and Chrissy had done, they did a lot of planning on it, to be sure. Probably one of the most gut-wrenching things when my book first came out, the first talk I actually gave was in Pennsylvania, very near to where Chrissy were, had worked in a dive shop. And a woman came up to me after the talk, and she was literally in tears, and she said, you know, I worked with Chrissy at that dive shop, and for weeks he was planning to do this dive. He was going over the deck plans of, of German U-boats, and he was calculating all of his gas consumptions and everything else. And everybody at the shop said to him, this is a really hairy dive you're planning. Maybe you should hold off on this. Maybe you should wait a while. But it was October 1992 that they were going to go out. It was going to be the last dive of the season, last opportunity of this season to solve this particular mystery. Chris and Chrissy had dived the U-boat a few times before, and Chrissy thought he knew where the captain's logbook was. So he was determined to do this. But the big catch was, these guys said they didn't have the money to afford helium for mixed gas, even though they were trained in helium and had used it. They were going to dive this wreck this time on air. So the dive is in approximately 75 meters that they're going to do on air, where Chrissy's going to crawl into this German U-boat, and we're going to see video of it shortly. He's going to crawl into this U-boat. He's very broken up, and he's going to start digging for the captain's logbook. The father will wait outside. If anything happens to Chrissy, the plan is the father will go out go down and, and help get his son out. That's a pretty sensible plan, but remember, it's on air. It's a whole lot of martinis that you're drinking on an empty stomach, right? No artifact is worth your life, right? We said that before. But people tried to point this out to Chris and Chrissy. My last conversation with the Rouses was two weeks before their last dive. And when Chrissy told me they were going to do this very difficult, very ambitious dive on air, I said, you, you got to be kidding me. And I knew these guys. I knew they didn't have a lot of experience on U-boats. Unlike the story I just told you about the Dory, where these guys did a very ambitious dive, the Russians didn't have anywhere near that type of experience on U-boats like the guys did on the Dory. But they wouldn't hear of it. And I said, well, you know, put your father on the phone. We talked about it. I said, Chris, what's going on? Why? Why are you doing this time? Are you doing this on air? Yeah, yeah. And in all the interviews I did for this book, every one of their close friends that I spoke to, every one of them said, I had that same conversation with those guys just before. 
And they refused to alter. They refused to consider that air was not a really good tool to be using for this particular dive. Obviously, there's a lot to think about when you're planning a dive, including the tools. So it's possible for a, a recreational sport diver to exceed what medical science can fix. One of the things that had happened to me a year before these guys were planning this dive was I got terrifically bent, which is described in my book, because of mistakes that I made, mistakes that could have been avoided. And Chris and Chrissy talked to me a lot about that, and they were pretty fascinated. I luckily got away with, with missing about two hours of decompression. Uh, I was doing a dive in about uh, 50 meters of water and blew off literally two hours of decompression. I just figured, oh, I'll get to a recompression chamber and I'll be okay. Sure, it'll hurt for a little bit, but uh, I'm tough, I can do that. I didn't realize I'd be fighting for my life on that dive boat. I literally was fighting for my life. And I'm lucky that I survived and that I have, well, fairly reasonably all of my faculty. Some of my friends would argue with that. Um, but I'm still able to dive. But Chris and Chrissy knew that story. And I think they had that in mind also, that if something happened to them, they could just get themselves into a recompression chamber and, and everything would be okay. But it didn't happen that way. One of the lessons of the last dive is if you can't afford the tools to make the dive as safe as possible, then you can't afford the dive. Of course, you don't have to dive deep. There's a lot of things you can do in shallow water. Here, this is a, a lobster. Um, we get these things off the... The, the coast of um, New York. Uh, one of the interesting things, by the way, you know, New Yorkers were all known to be like tough and all that stuff. But the lobsters, they like to fight you. These guys, they don't run away. The, the ones that they have down in Florida, uh, those are chicken lobsters. They just run away. <laughs> they, they don't have these big claws and stuff. The ones in California, they're even worse. They're just flaky, you know. Um, but of course, you can get even things like this. A buddy of mine, Samuel Shmami, he got this in. Uh, uh, about 35, 40 meters of water. And here, this is one of the best stories. This is a guy who came up. This is in about the 25 meters of water off the coast of New Jersey. A guy recovered these things. These are uh, gold coins. And this is a, a gold diamond ring that he recovered from uh, an 1800s sailing ship that sank. This was after a storm. Um, and the best thing I like about this was the guy did not report this to Internal Revenue. <laughs> But of course, we're back at the U-boat. So what happened on that fatal day? Um, on the fatal day itself, Chris and Chrissy went out in October 1992. They were on the Seeker. And they wanted to go down and, and do this dive to recover the captain's logbook to hopefully reveal what this U-boat was and maybe even what its mission was. They'd be heroes, right? They'd be famous for solving this mystery. But when they got up in the morning to do their dive, the weather was absolutely horrible. This is a, an overnight trip. It's fairly far <coughs> offshore. And um, they just looked at the, uh, the weather. And Chrissy said, you know, Dad, I don't think we should do this dive. Very bad sea conditions. The storm looks like it's moving in, all this stuff. But in typical Rouse Bicker Brothers fashion, the father starts questioning his son's motivation. But this was typical for him. But his son and father saying, ah, you're not a real diver. You're a wimp. Why did I bring you out here? Why did they even bother to teach you diving and that kind of thing? And then these guys start going back and forth and bickering and arguing and arguing. And then finally, Chrissy says, OK, let's go diving. I'll go do the diving. And the father says, ah, I was only kidding. You're right. It, it, it's really crappy. We shouldn't do diving. So Chrissy, the son, is really mad. He says, oh, what do you mean? You're the wimp. You know, you're not a diver, blah, blah, blah. So then the argument starts all over again. And the father says, OK, let's go diving. Neither one of these guys, when they got up, wanted to do this dive. It was just a you know, crazy idea. First of all, it's on the air, right? It's deep, and the weather's bad. <coughs> the last thing that Chris Rouse, the father, says to anybody before he goes in the water, the only uh, woman, Barb Landa, the only woman paying customer on the boat is helping him get suited up. And he says to her, I hope I don't regret making this dive. She says, well, if you don't feel comfortable, don't do the dive. Blow it off. He says, no, no, I got to dive. Junior's going and I got to go diving with him because they always dove together. So both men go and do this dive where they didn't feel comfortable. And they, they go down and they do the thing. 
Neither one of them wanted to get the experience, really, on U-boats. There's a bunch of U-boats off the US coast in much shallower water, much warmer water. This one is the U-352 off of North Carolina. And they just wouldn't hear of it. They had to do the dive then. Ironically, this picture was taken just one month before their excuse me, fatal last dive. We can see the sun here. This is on the seeker also. We can see the sun, Chrissy, who just finished the dive, and he's kind of flopped up over the ladder and just is talking about, oh, dives on the seeker just drive me to exhaustion. And the father is, is looking over him here. And this picture is courtesy of Captain Steve Gatto. Ironically, a month later, the father would be declared dead right about over here after his last dive. We'll go over what we think happened to these guys when we look at the video in a second. I bring up a bunch of things on, in my book, whether or not, even though this is nitrox, but I talk about whether or not mixed gases would have helped them on the dives or whether underwater communications would have helped. By the way, this is on an archaeological project. I, I know you know like this. This is on a, a US archaeological project with advanced communication. Ooh, look at what the government is paying for. <laughs> And we can afford wars, but not, uh, not good comms gear for our archaeologists. There are a lot of amazing diving stories and a lot of lessons in the last dive. We've only covered some of them here, and we'll cover some of them as we look at the video. Um, this is a shot of the Wahoo taken at sunset. No matter where you guys like to dive, and no matter where it is, if it's deep or shallow, please don't let your guard down, because it can always happen. It can happen to you. I didn't think it would happen to me. If you haven't read, I know most of you have read the book, but if you haven't, read that account of, of getting bent horrifically. When Don, when you were talking about all that, and you and I have known each other for years, I know what you're talking about with all of the, the, the vertigo and everything else. It's terrible. And when you have not only your diving, your sport, potentially taken away from you, what a crippling thing, but when you potentially can't walk again, or can't do things, what a, what a terrible thing. You realize, wow, this is really bad. Um, there are consequences so that even if you come up and get into a recompression chamber, it, it doesn't mean that we can fix you. Okay? Uh, the video that you're going to see was shot by Captain John Chatterton five days after the Rouse's last dive. We're going to see some of their equipment on the deck of the U-boat and some of their equipment inside the U-boat. And what Chrissy had said because he survived for quite a number of hours before he died. What Chrissy had said, we're going to start talking about that because we have to piece together, we want to piece together what happened to them. I purchased limited broadcast rights from Captain Chatterton so that I could show this video. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Arch McNamara, Captain John Chatterton, photographers Captain Steve Belinda, Captain Hank Garvin, Captain Steve Gatto, Larry Cohen, Pete Naraki, Mason Logie, Wes Skiles, Dr. Ken Kambler, Linda Heslop, and Sue Rouse. And so let's go ahead and show this. What I'm going to do is just narrate over. So in the event, these guys have dived in the water, right? Neither one of them wanted to do the dive. And they end up coming up. They had planned the dive for 20 minutes at a depth of about 80 meters. <coughs> In the event, they came up 40-some minutes after they went in the water. They popped up in front of the dive boat. Captain John Chatterton uh, was there and saw them and knew that these guys were probably in trouble and asked them if they had done any decompression. No, they hadn't done any decom. These guys blew off many, many hours of decompression. And so they're facing severe decompression sickness at this point. What we're looking at right now is one of the Rouse's uh, bottles along with, um, along with one of their bags. It's a canvas bag for tools. And I do want to know, by the way, Michelle, where the Dur method is of putting all your tools, like your crowbars and all that, and your lump hammer. I want to know that, because it's not in JJ's book. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, um, here's one of the oxygen bottles. You can see the name Rouse over here on another one of their bottles. Some people have noted, well, why did these guys not run a guideline from their stage bottles? One of the things that Shaq Exley found out when he did the accident analysis, remember we talked about that earlier, was that the number one reason that people were dying inside of caves was that they did not run a guideline to open water. The Rouses were very skilled cave divers, very well trained in that. 
But in this particular case, I have to believe uh, and agree with, with Captain John Chatterton when Chatterton says, you know, these guys just looked at a U-boat and asked, well, what's a U-boat? It's this small little thing. It's a few hundred feet, I guess, you know, uh, what, less than 100 meters long. How difficult can this be to navigate? So it, right away, they got complacent with that. They didn't take into account that something might happen to them. They only started running their guideline from the penetration point that, that Chrissy was going to go in, and that was some distance from their tanks. Chatterton's going to go and show us a guideline reel. Big, it's a dive right explorer reel, which is fairly large. And we can see, you can see some of the line here. And he's actually going to go down and pick up the reel and show that they had cut the line. When Chrissy got back onto the deck of the boat, and but he was he could not get himself up the ladder. He had to be physically helped back onto the boat. When he got back onto the boat, he spoke about what happened. He spoke about something falling on him as he was digging for the captain's logbook. But he said he was also hallucinating so much because he had missed so much decompression. The nitrogen was affecting his brain. He was screaming. The monster was going to get me. The monster was going to get me. Um, so you can imagine at 80 meters on air, this guy's inside the U-boat and something collapses on him. Visibility goes to zero. Imagine what happened to his narcotic level. It would have just shot right through the roof. But the father did come in and get his son out of the wreck. I think that speaks highly of their skills as divers, that they even got themselves out of it. But Chrissy kept saying they trying to get out. They couldn't find their way out because they kept bumping into stuff. And as you'll see, Chatterton's going to pick up part of uh, a life raft from the U-boat. And you'll see how quickly the visibility deteriorates. Well, you can imagine it with this shelving unit is what we think fell on Chrissy. With this shelving unit falling on him and the father having to come in and drag him out, there's absolutely no visibility. And one of the things that divers reported afterward was that there was this rubberized canvas. There were pieces of it all over that particular compartment. So we think they took their knives out and started slashing at it. Christy was talking about a monster trying to get him. Was, he was hallucinating, right? And we could see the line wrapped all over the place in here. Now, some people say, well, there was a big storm that came through and all that stuff. Maybe that moved some of the line around. That may explain, might explain some of it. But I think that in all of this stuff, all of the line wrapped around everywhere, I think a lot of that was just the Rouse was trying to get back out. And they were literally going back and forth. Because as trained cave divers, they would have tried to go with their line. And they should have been reeling the line in. But apparently, they weren't doing that. And that's why you see all this line everywhere. So they violated, really, their own, their own uh, training. They didn't have a guideline all the way back out to their tanks. Here you see more of their line. They didn't have a guideline out all the way out to their tanks. And ultimately, when they did get outside of the wreck, they, were, they had come out of a different hole than they went in. At least that's what John Chatterton had surmised. Um, and being, he was right there. And then so they thought, okay, my, our tanks are over here. They were swimming around for their tanks, and they couldn't find their tanks. They found one bottle, and then they came up, and as they were coming up, Chrissy tried to switch over to the other bottle, and all he kept getting was water coming through. And, and later analysis of the gear showed that the mouthpiece was ripped and would have allowed water, and that might have just been Chrissy biting down too hard. Maybe he was petrified, and you know, we don't quite know what happened there. Um, but Chrissy claimed that he couldn't breathe any gas, and that's when they both came directly up to the surface. Here we see the, the uh, lifeboat. So in the event, the father was first to the ladder, according to eyewitness accounts, but he wouldn't go up the ladder. He wanted his son taken up first. And when they finally got Chrissy on board, the father knew his son, or thought his son would be safe. And Chrissy, Chris, the father, actually died in the water. <coughs> he literally died of decompression sickness. Why? What happens? Well, you have so much nitrogen in your system, it's coming out, it turns to foam. Your blood turns to foam. Your heart can't pump foam. So this is not a, a pleasant way to go. Chrissy, being much younger and more fit than his father, 
uh, did survive. He did get into a recompression chamber. And the guy that I now work with in, in hyperbarics actually was the hyperbaric guy <coughs> on call when they brought him in. Um, he was hallucinating horribly. Christy was actually asking, even on the boat, for somebody to shoot him, that he was in that much pain. He was serious. He wanted literally to die. He was in that much pain. And I can tell you, and I'm sure Don can tell you, if you take a hit like this, it is really, really painful. It's not something you want to go through. And if the talks that I think I gave, or, or Don had said it before also, that, that he had given, if this helps prevent any one of you from, from getting hurt, from taking a dive too complacently, then I think it's worth it to have given the talk and, and to have written the book. You see here how quickly the visibility is going to help. There was a version of this that Chatterton had narrated for the wife and mother, Sue Rouse, that he gave to her. And I had seen that, and John did not want that released to the public. It was basically something just for um, you know, the family and for Sue to try to understand what might have happened to her, her husband and her son. It was very tragic because uh, she was told that they had had an accident, but she didn't realize at all how bad it was. And when she went to the hospital, she didn't realize her son, her husband was already dead. And her son, um, he was in the recompression chamber, but she had no idea how badly off he was. And uh, he died just shortly before she got there, and she said his body was still warm when they wheeled him out. Um, Bill, uh, Bill Hamilton, who was actually had given a presentation here at the last tech show, and is a world-renowned physiologists and literally said these guys, from a physiological standpoint, these guys were, were dead when they hit the surface because of how much nitrogen loading they would have had in their system. That even if they had gotten into a recompression chamber immediately, like on the boat, what could have saved them? They would have had to have been pressed down to about 90 meters and had immediate and, and continuous blood transfusions to off-gas that nitrogen loading. I think we're going to have the lights and, and shut it off here. So as I said, there are, there are many lessons that we can learn from the last dive. We've only covered some of them. Um, if you haven't read the book, I obviously you know read it because a lot of divers are getting a lot out of it. If you have some questions for me, I'd be happy to answer those. There's a question over here.